Revive is a, a phase two study looking at, at uh, using an agent called Rusfortide, which is a, a hepcidin mimetic, um, which is kind of a unique approach. But but I think to talk about kind of the rationale for the endpoint, we have to think about you know what what are our areas of unmet need with polycythemia vera, and and what this focuses on is is one area of unmet need, which is this need for um, a therapeutic phlebotomy to control hematocrit levels and thus reduce the risk for, for thrombosis in patients that have polycythemia vera. This is really a, a um, key component of the treatment algorithm for patients with PV. We often talk about baby aspirin, therapeutic phlebotomies, um, and, and then plus or minus the need for cytoreductive therapy. Um, Unfortunately, therapeutic phlebotomies can be quite challenging for patients um, and, and quite archaic when you think about the idea of, of draining blood from people as part of a, a modern approach to a hematologic malignancy. It seems a bit uh, outdated. Um, and, and though it's something that many patients can tolerate effectively, it, it really comes with a high cost of, of having to come into a, a medical center. You're tied to the healthcare system to get blood work, uh, long phlebotomies. Um, these can sometimes take days out of your schedule. Um, and while this isn't a challenge for many patients, for, for, for other folks, it can be quite, quite life altering uh, and really uh, affects their ability to work. It ties them to the healthcare system. They can't travel. They can't do a lot of the things they would otherwise like to do. And this doesn't even get to the point that many patients don't tolerate phlebotomies well. The, the rapid fluid shifts can cause them to have presyncopal episodes. Um, they may have poor venous access, uh, which can be quite challenging. Um, and uh, and then beyond that, you talk about the the idea and the end result of, of repeated phlebotomies in in patients that that rapidly use iron to make red blood cells. Is uh, ultimately many of these patients become profoundly iron deficient, and and we know that iron deficiency itself can lead to poor quality of life and 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 symptoms. We're not really sure how much of those symptoms are are what drive. Um, uh, the, the highest symptom burden that many PV patients have. Clearly, the disease causes symptoms as well, but some of that might be uh, um, kind of exacerbated by this, this state of chronic iron deficiency. So, so with those kind of um, challenges in mind, the, the thought was is, is um, with a hepcide mimetic, we potentially we can leverage um, um, our understanding of iron regulation uh, to kind of trick the body into thinking that it is a, in an iron full state with uh, pro providing hepcidin uh, and and not allowing uh, available iron to make red blood cells. And uh, in doing so, we might be able to control the blood count at a safe level uh, without the need for, for therapeutic phlebotomies. Um, and so to, to kind of test that theory, it makes sense that the primary endpoint would be the need for phlebotomies um, in, in patients taking this agent. And so that's kind of how the study was, was designed. I think that, that one of the things that we always, you know, primarily we wanted to find out is whether or not this is effective in reducing the need for phlebotomies in, in patients that had previously required them. But then very importantly, we also wanted to know, is, does this convey into better quality of life for patients? Do patients feel better? Uh, at the end of the day uh, related to this. And so so that kind of explains a little bit of the rationale, the, the reason for the primary endpoint, but also some of our, our thoughts as far as looking at symptoms as well. You know, the way this study was, was designed is you had this kind of phase, you know, first part of the study, um, which was really titrating the dose and, and, and trying to find the right dose for the individual patient to control their phlebotomy requirements. Then there was this blinded withdrawal period where uh, half the patients were taken off the study drug and the other half continued on that to see what would happen there. And then after that was the open label extension study. And so uh, what we saw in this blinded withdrawal period is, is really the stark effect that this drug has, which is those patients that came off um, uh, the study drug uh, very, very often required the need for phlebotomy soon after that, uh, and then were, were proceeded on to the open label extension. Those patients that did not that stayed on the respiratide were able to really continue to not require phlebotomies uh, going forward. And so, so overall, I think that was kind of proof of concept. I mean, I think this is a little bit of a unique design within a phase two study, where oftentimes. You're, you're enrolling patients, um, everyone's getting the study drug, you're seeing effects and, and you're trying to kind of define them within the context of historical controls. Uh, within the study, you have this kind of brief little period where you can perform a blinded comparison to really see, see, see the impact. And I think it was pretty stark, the differences that we saw during that blinded withdrawal period. You 
Yeah, I think that, that what's easy about um, interpreting this data is it's very clear what this drug does. Um, it's very clear that, that, you know, based on what we've seen in the phase two data, that respiratide is able to rapidly and efficiently alleviate the need for phlebotomy in patients that have required phlebotomies previously. There is an ongoing phase three study um, that, is, that is really going to, to test that very rigorously. Um, and hopefully we'll get positive results of that study in the future, showing what we've seen in the phase two study as well. But if I was to look into the future, I think that where this agent really positions itself is for those folks that are struggling uh, with phlebotomies. I think that now we have a way of maintaining hematocrit control uh, in a very consistent fashion uh, without these spikes of kind of getting a phlebotomy, hem hematocrit rises, getting another phlebotomy, hematocrit rises, and, and so forth and so on. In a, in a, bit, in a way, we can reach this equi equilibrium of a stable hematocrit um, that, that patients can control themselves uh, with a well-tolerated uh, medication that doesn't tie them to the healthcare system. And and, um, and certainly, I think the patients that struggle with phlebotomies are the ones that are going to be benefit the most. You can certainly make an argument for, for anyone that needs phlebotomies, even if they tolerate it okay, could benefit from this because it's a, maybe a safer way to keep this at a at a more stable um, uh, regimen. But but I think certainly you get into complicated questions there regarding uh, cost and 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 uh, and whether or not it's worthwhile to do from that standpoint. But I think that certainly this is this is maintaining hematocrit control in a much more stable fashion than what we normally see with therapeutic phlebotomies. Beyond that, I think you could look at other patient populations that were not included on our study. Um, you could think about patients that uh, may need rapid cytoreduction, um, who who present newly diagnosed, who have high hematocrit levels, and maybe need need to bring that have that hematocrit level brought down in in a timely fashion, and, and where where phlebotomies and repeated phlebotomies might be challenging. I think these are some unique ways to look at this uh, going forward. Um, and then again, I think that. One of the factors that will be very key that, that we talked about from the phase two study, but that we'll also see in more detail from the phase three study is, is really the impact this has on patient symptoms. And so I think one of the areas of, of massive unmet need for polycythemia vera patients is the ability to improve the symptoms they have on a day-to-day -day basis. What, even if we're controlling hematocrit, we're in, inhibiting platelets with aspirin, we have patients on cytoreductive therapy, Patients inherently could still complain of, of a variety of symptoms, many of which include concentration issues, fatigue, itching, uh, inactivity, uh, really just inability to kind of proceed with their normal lives as they did before their diagnosis. And, and I think it'll be important to see whether or not respiratide is able to kind of improve or, or add to uh, the, the ability to improve some of these symptoms since it acts in a different way than many of the agents that we currently have. Yeah, I, I think the one thing that we focused on in, in the presentation and the poster that we had at EHA, we had a few. I mean, certainly had the late breaking abstract talking about the phase two data, but I think the the, the one area that, you know, I think that I've been most excited about is, is symptoms. And I touched on this earlier, but but to be able to see kind of a snippet of, of how patients did, you know, in the first 28 weeks when everyone was on study, to see these consistent improvement in things like concentration, fatigue, and inactivity. You know, these are very vague symptoms, but ones that often associate very closely with quality of life in patients. And so while this is a phase two data, it's certainly early and, and it's a small signal to see consistent improvements um, in patients that are, are, are um, uh, being treated with respiratide as compared to placebo. I think that that's very exciting and, and we'll certainly have to, to see where that goes. Mm -hmm.